Hello, hello, and welcome to the Beetle College Make Along, Collage Make Along. I'm Ebony, your host for today's Festival of Nature session, and we have the wonderful Marion Hill joining us today. Marion's love and fascination for the mini beasts of the UK was the inspiration for her project Buzz and Scuttle, which we're going to find out about and we're going to get involved with too. So using the artistic medium of collage, Marion took to collaging as many UK insects as possible as a teaching aid to help educate children about the extraordinary insects right underneath our noses and the vital jobs that they do. It's been an amazing collaborative project featuring Bathscape, local children, neighbours, entomologists, new friends and even scientists found on Twitter. Because did you know there are approximately 4,000 beetles in the UK and even in our urban areas there are way more than you think. But these wonderful critters need a voice so that we can collectively protect them to do their vital jobs such as waste disposal, pest control and pollination. Marion is doing an awesome job at being this voice and she's inspiring the next generation to be a voice too by using art to help our planet one collage at a time. So what can you expect from today's session? Well, firstly, we're going to hear from Marion about the wonderful project Buzz and Scuttle and the inspiration for this and what it aims to achieve. And then secondly, Marion's going to take us through a live collage make along. So grab your magazines and your print stick and your scissors because we are going to be doing this along with her. You'll also have the chance to ask Marion questions as we go to find out how you can get involved with Buzz and Scuttle and learn about ways that we can all support the wonderful mini beasts in our local area too. So let's get started. Marion grew up in Somerset and is an illustrator and has been for over 15 years and has tutored students and is currently working as a senior lecturer on illustration at the University of West of England, Bristol. So welcome, welcome to the Festival of Nature 2021, Marion. How are you today? I'm good, thanks. And thank you to my, hey, welcome to my slightly messy studio. When you're a collage artist, you do make an awful lot of a mess. So I've tried to tidy up for you, but I've still got quite a lot of piles of things around. I feel like, look, I'm channeling you here, you know, I've got, <laughs> I've got my mess. It's good. It's good. good. <laughs> yeah, so um, I'm really looking forward to doing some collage with you today. And the amazing thing about collage is it, it's so easy to do and anybody can have a go. So there's nothing fancy about my technique whatsoever. It's kind of the same technique you'd use at preschool. So um, I love it. That's what yeah. I love. <laughs> so, Marion, how did the Buzz and Scuttle project come along? Because I believed it was sparked by taking your illustrator students to the Natural History Unit. Yeah, I've got a friend, Helen Hardy, that works behind the scenes at the Natural History Museum. And she really kindly organised a group of my illustration students to come in and see what's going on with the digitisation of the collection. They're photographing everything. It's amazing. And we got taken on a backstage tour by Gavin Broad, who's um, one of the creators of insects. And I found seeing all the insects in the collection incredibly inspiring. But it took me a couple of years, really, to work out what I could do with that sort of amazing amount of information that he'd given us on the day. And I was also really worried about climate change. And I'd been worrying, but not doing anything about it. And I thought maybe if I started illustrating insects, I could kind of help draw people's attention to the amazing insects that are living all around us. So I started off thinking it would take me a couple of weeks and <laughs> started looking at what was in our garden. And over a year and a half later, I've collaged way over a hundred uh, insects. I'm nowhere near even a, a tiny bit of the way through. And as, as soon as I see one thing, I see 10 more. So I've been having a lot of help with a local entomologist called Mike Williams, who's been giving me ex expert advice. And I've been spotting things by crawling around our garden, which I've been trying to rewild. Um, yeah, and the project's just growing and growing, which is wonderful. Yeah. And it has kind of snowballed, hasn't it? Because you started with just one type of bug and, you know, where is it taking you now? Oh, 
Endlessly, yes. So I think what it's really told me is how amazing the insects are that are all around us and the fact there's not just five things in the garden, there's hundreds and hundreds. So my hope is that everyone else will start crawling around their gardens and spotting what they can see. And the more people that notice what's around them, um, the more understanding we've got, the more knowledge we've got, and the more people realise how amazing these bugs and beetles are. So they'll start protecting them and nurturing them instead of bug spraying them and trying to get rid of them yeah absolutely absolutely so I think on that note I think let's get going with our make along and I think it's really important to note that it doesn't matter if it's not realistic or it's a bit messy the whole point of this session is to have fun and just like Marion says just begin to notice the beauty in these insects and how they're constructed um so yeah let's get going so Marion maybe you can take us through the initial steps to get started OK, right. Well, like I said, you can be as messy with this as you want and you could do a completely imaginated, um, imaginary beetle or you could try and copy accurately something that you've seen, which is what I'll be doing because I want my um, insects to be reference points so you can recognise them out in the garden. But there's certain things that beetles have that really you need to try and include. So they've all got um, a head, uh, two antennae, six legs, two eyes and... Um, uh, an electro which covers the um, thorax and ab ab sorry the abdomen and then they have a thorax it's really difficult for me to do this because it's upside down so if I point in the wrong direction I'm trying to get used to this so <laughs> the um where the wing case is covered with this amazing shell you get all kinds of amazing patterns so you can choose your patterns and put whatever you like there or copy one that you've seen in the garden so this is one that I made earlier it's a two-spot ladybird um, so I thought I'd have a go at making one one of those today and um, two spot ladybirds are in danger in this country their numbers have been dwindling so if you're lucky enough to spot one out in your garden you're um, you're having a really good day they're quite small so you have to really um, look hard to find them so I'm going to move this away so you can see now all I do to make my collages is chop up magazines so first of all check with whoever owns the magazine that they don't want it anymore um, <laughs> and I was actually checked with my mum I literally just <laughs> <laughs> and once you've discovered that, then literally all I do with it is look through and find bits of magazine that have got interesting colours. Uh, these are food magazine bits with carrots and stuff. Yeah, and then I literally just chop them up. So for the ladybird, obviously we needed two nice big bits for the wing cases. So I've cut a lovely big red um, circle and I've cut it in half. And then to stick things down, you could use something as simple as a glue stick or PVA. And if I show you, this is my PVA, which I mixed up with a tiny bit of water and I've got a really cheap glue brush. It's really easy to use, really cheap to produce. So I'm gonna stick some glue behind them. But I think first of all, I'll get all the pieces cut out and then we can do the gluing part when we're chatting maybe. So we've got the two wing cases and then I've got this which is the thorax which is sort of the middle part of the body and then I'm going to need a head so let's see what I've got here I'm just going to chop out so if you look to your magazine and you find something that looks about the right size all you do is cut it out so if I can move that down a bit so you can see it there we go that's going to be my head and then I've got antennae so I've chopped these out earlier just so it would take me a long time and then there we go so it's very difficult I've discovered to cut and talk at the same time Okay. It is. Now, uh, eyes, I've discovered, I've got this picture of some olives that I found in a food magazine. They make great eyes because what you need with eyes is a, a bit of sparkle yeah. in the middle. And the olives have that. So I'm going to cut out two eyes. And if you're joining us live, people, then do pop in the comments perhaps what uh, what beetle or bug or invertebrate you have you have chosen and let us know in the comments too. And if you've got questions for Marion, then pop them in and we'll get them up and she'll answer them too. Yes, I can't always promise to answer all the questions accurately because there's loads that I still don't know. And that's why the people on Twitter and experts who have been helping me are so useful because there's thousands of beetles. So sometimes you really need help finding out which uh, species you've found. And you can you can have an app on your phone called the iNaturalist app, where if you see something you don't know what it is, you take a photo and upload it to the site and then an expert will be on hand to try and help name it. And this has been really helpful. Um, or I put a photo on Twitter and somebody will ha kindly help me. Okay, so we've got the antenna in the eyes. Now I'm going to start with legs. So um, 
we're going to have six legs and they've normally got a lots of parts to them that some have more than others but they usually follow a kind of pattern where there's a joint wow. I'm just, just going to let you know we've got some people in today we've got sarah saying she's doing a buff tail bumblebee queen oh Perfect. fantastic so she's doing that and how are you going to do the fluff that's the hard bit with bumblebees it's really fun trying to snip so all the fluff shows um there we go. you got any tips for that any tips for fluff uh well i found a, a magazine with lots of pictures of teddy bears that was great because they're fluffy so i could chop out the picture of the teddy bears and then just do lots of little cuts around the bottom to make it look fluffy there we go, Sarah, some tips for you. <laughs> there we go. So I'm just sticking my legs on now. So we've got the six legs, fab. Six legs. And, and then they tend to have these little jointed bits at the bottom. There we go. And so, you know, what's the appeal of collage uh, for you? You know, why use this as the medium to kind of give these insects a voice? Well, I think I love collage because you can do it at home. And the colours that you can cut out from print are so vibrant and they've got lovely textures to them. So um, I started doing this a long, long time ago because I didn't have a computer and I needed a, a vibrant way of making work at home. Um, and I've got addicted to it ever since. So uh, computers have got a lot better since I started and most illustrators work digitally. But I still absolutely love cutting and snipping real bits of paper and getting covered in glue. I think I'm just quite a messy person and I really enjoy the process of actually sticking real things down. Yeah, and it's immediate and fun and it's available to everyone, like you said. It is. Yeah, it is. And lots of people, they save magazines for me and they um, come round with things that I could use for collage. And these days as well, I take photographs of textures I see and then um, get printed them out into photo books sometimes so that I can um, use that, my own photos as collage material as well. There wow. we go. Now, obviously, this isn't as, as sort of refined and uh, as my normal collage, because normally a collage would take me a whole day to do. Um, so it is a bit of a cut and paste job today rather fast, but it, I think it, get, it gives the idea. And then if you've got more time than me, obviously you do a much better job and really look at what the insect looks like and try and reproduce it with the collage. So the tips I've heard so far, Marion, is get prepared. So, you know, get your magazines, ask permission, get, get things cut up that you like the look of and the texture of, and then you can play around with that on the paper before you start sticking. Yes, and don't worry if it doesn't turn out exactly as you want it. It's, some people find sticking quite tricky and others take to it really easily. So it yeah. honestly doesn't matter if it looks a bit messy when you're starting out. It's just really good fun to practice with. I'm going to start using glue now, so this might go really wrong and I might spill it everywhere. Okay. And I think collage is really lovely as well, Marion, because it, it, it almost showcases the kind of um, compartments that are so visual and obvious in beetles, you know? It, I find that. You know, it goes really well with their form, if you if you like. It does. It really does. Yeah. And um, I think they are such, such structural creatures, aren't they? You're totally right. The tricky part I found sometimes is trying to collage the shiny beetles. That's a real challenge when the light shines off them because you want them to look really rounded and beautiful. Um, so using collage, then I have to hunt for a long time sometimes to find the right bits to make my beetle look as shiny as possible. And they do look like paintings I think when I've finished most people don't realize that um, they are collages because uh, they can look so realistic I mean I couldn't believe this so I'm doing a peacock butterfly right now so that's Marion's peacock butterfly which I think you can see there is incredibly realistic because that's the actual real one from my um from the side of my house so I'm I just cannot believe that that is a collage isn't that incredible Yep. absolutely incredible it's just cut out bits of magazine that's all it is and um i think that you'll find at home that you can get really good results from this just by a bit of patience that's all it takes careful cutting and a bit of patience that's sometimes what we all need a little bit it's quite a nice mindful exercise isn't it yes you can totally lose track of time when you're collaging that's for sure so marion these little critters are kind of often seen as pests um, have you found that, you know, with your collages and the workshops that you've been doing with schools and local communities, have they kind of helped to change people's viewpoints, you know, of, of them being pests and being something else? And have you got any memorable reflections on this? Yeah, well, I think 
it's my reflections on my own um, way I used to look after the garden I found amazing because the things I did in our garden which I really didn't think how how damaging they were to the wildlife because we used to cut our lawn all the time and I used to pull the weeds out and get rid of them to the tip um, and I didn't realize that loads of beetles they need undergrowth and they need certain things in the garden like piles of dead sticks and old logs if you put those things back into your garden all of a sudden the number of beetles and bugs will start going up and I had no idea there were beetles that kill um, the pests, well, little uh, other things that gardeners think are a pest. So there's beetles, ground beetles that eat slugs and snails. Um, ladybirds eat aphids that bother some gardeners because they get all over their roses. So if you nurture certain um, beetles and bugs, they'll help you in the garden, not hinder you. And that's something I really haven't any clue about and I didn't realize that we have dung beetles in in cow pats and poo on fields um, which are helping to break down all the poo and bury it in the soil and, and make our soil all nice and nutrient rich I have no idea I thought dung beetles were something you saw in a nature program about sort of African savannah pushing dung along in little balls I didn't realize we had our own and they are so vital and amazing we need to protect them yeah, I think that's that's such a lovely reflection. I love actually the reflection, especially if you think about the difficult year that we've all had over the last 18 months. You know, we don't necessarily need to go to Africa or far flung places. We've got these amazing kind of garden safaris right under our noses if we only just take a little moment of time to look. Yes, and the colours are quite astounding. And what I'm also learning about um, bu bugs, um, if I can just try and find a printout I've got, and I'll put it under my camera just for a minute, is they change form. So shield bugs, um, they split their skin when it becomes too small for them when they're growing, and they walk out looking completely different. So this collage of, is of the same bug. It's of a blue shield bug, and the, the red one on the left is the baby, or one of the babies, and, and the version on the right is the adult bug. So not only do you have to learn all the different species, but the species can change the way they look loads of times. So it's completely fascinating and endless in the amount that you have to learn. But also it means that you can make amazing discoveries in your garden because there's not that many people studying beetles and bugs. So um, if you log what you're citing, sometimes you can see something that hasn't been spotted for ages. And it really helps our understanding of what's actually in our urban environment if you keep a lookout. Yeah, and I think that comes back to that point about getting um, using apps like iNaturalist, which allow us to all log and see what's going on. Yes, and there's no shame in admitting you don't know what you're looking at because it, there are so many to choose from. So it's good to have support and um, expert advice on hand. Yeah, 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 absolutely. There we go. We're getting the legs stuck on now. How are you getting on, Emily? Are we allowed oh, to see your collage? Yeah, I am. Um, <laughs> so I'm doing the... Um, I'm doing the peacock butterfly here. So I've started with the top two uh, wings there. So I think we are, yeah, we're coming along nicely. I, again, I've got food magazines and furniture magazines were great for some of the, the sides. And then s the sky gives a lovely texture, you know, with different hues of blue there as well. So yeah. it's getting there. It's getting there. I think uh, it's about noticing, isn't it? It's about noticing when you're collaging, but also noticing in the garden, because I think I, I just never really looked carefully before what was always there. So the two skills are quite similar, really. I spend a lot of time trying to find the right bits to make the collage, and I spend a lot of time crawling around the garden looking for things that have been all under my nose and I never bothered to notice. And I have found that kids are far better at searching for bugs than, than adults a lot of the time. They're a bit lower down and they've got sharper eyes and they remember things brilliantly well. So what's been amazing is um, the local kids and my own children have been helping Helping me with this project by coming to show me what they found and um, drawing my attention to things that I haven't noticed. That's incredible. Yeah, that's incredible. I think I think that's a really good point to note. Actually, um, you know, children can actually be a bigger influencer or, or nudge um, than the adults sometimes when it comes to protecting our environment and our climate. Would you agree? Totally, because they see things so clearly, and they don't get sort of uh they don't worry about what people other people think they just see see what needs to be done and get on with it so yeah I think kids are the best people to work with on this they're always inspiring and um and full of energy as well 
So perhaps talk to us then about the workshops you are going to be hoping to run as the world opens up. Um, and in doing so, what are you hoping that those workshops are going to achieve? Oh, well, of course, plans are always changing because um, social distancing rules change. So, But I am hoping to do some online workshops for Forest of the Imagination, which is a, a, ba a bath um, festival that's coming soon. And I think they're going to be online now, but um, there'll be lots of notification about that. And then I'm hoping to slowly go into more and more schools. So if you're watching this and you're interested, then do contact me and um, find out what's going on or whether I could come and see you um, and talk about beetles because um, I'd love to come in and into schools and see people I think I've stuck all my legs back on back to front because I've been trying to talk to you at the same time so <laughs> this is the, the wonkiest beetle I've ever collaged I think <laughs> and you know art is such an important medium isn't it for creativity for slowing down for getting you know observant is this is this something you really want to champion within our kind of younger generation and and how do you feel art is kind of valued at the moment within within yeah. schools I think um, you have to learn that it's about making the stuff as well as the final project pro product. So when I'm sitting and drawing or collaging, it's about it's about doing the co uh, the drawing or the collage and looking at what I'm um, observing really carefully. And that's the fun part. And I think you need to stop worrying so much about the final product and whether it's neat enough, and just enjoy the process of playing and making. And I think that's really important because sometimes when you've got lots of exams all the time, people end up just making the final pieces as neat as they can and they forget to have fun along the way. So that's what I'd like to people to do today is to have a go. And even if you don't think your collage is the neatest, it will be wonderful. So um, be proud of it and just have fun making it. Absolutely. Absolutely. There we go. I'm just sticking my last wing case on now and I have got glue all over my hands now. If anybody else, I managed to make more mess, I think, than most people. So this isn't the neatest job. Normally when I'm collaging, I do wash my hands a lot. So I keep the glue on the on the back of the paper. But because today I can't move because I've got my headphones on, um, <laughs> I am slowly sticking to myself. <laughs> Here we go. Let's get this done. I've already got people saying that you should come to Tring the best natural history museum park. Oh, fantastic. Yeah, Tring's a little wet, a little drive away from me, but um, it is an amazing place. I've been there before. That sounds great. Here we go. It's good to know that someone in Tring is watching. That's really lovely. Okay, I'm just going to smooth my collage down by putting a piece of paper over the back and just rubbing it. So this might help. Hopefully nothing will come off. There we go. That's a great tip. There we go. And I can, I'll show you quickly uh, just a few of the insects I've put on a print. So I'll, I'll just show you how many. Here we go. This is a copy of the print that I've just been making. So these are just a few of the UK beetles that may be scurrying around your local woodland or garden. So I can't show the whole thing because it won't fit under my camera. But it gives you some ideas. That's uh, hundreds and hundreds of things that you can spot. And there's amazing beetles that break down dead carcasses as well. Um, sexton beetles are incredible. They look after their babies by feeding them rotting flesh off dead dead creatures that have fallen into the ground in woodland um, and do an amazing job just clearing stuff away. Um, they're beautiful beetles. They're black with lovely orange patterns on them. So I'm always hoping to see one of those. I wonder if anyone's listening has got a favourite beetle that they could message in to say what they oh, yeah. found. Love yeah. to hear that. Love to hear that. And that's what I think you highlight as well, Marin, is that not only have you got so many of these amazing creatures, um, not only are they so diverse in how they look but they're actually really diverse in the roles that they play you know yes. you from there a couple of things that you stopped doing like using uh, pesticides and stuff you know what other what other um actions are people taking or are you encouraging people to take in order to kind of help these beetles and help these bugs okay so yes i think in a garden if you're looking at your little space outside and it could be a tiny space and um, there's certain things that i've done that have just don't definitely helped so i've got a very small pond so there's a water source in the garden um i don't clear away dead dead sticks so i have a nice big pile of dead sticks i've got a compost heap which strangely i don't ever really use the compost i use it as a house for beetles so and worms so it's full of, of stuff and the slow worms live in there as well um and then 
then um, we have dead logs that are rotting away and lots of places for insects to hide. And the other thing that I used to do that I've tried to stop doing now is keep digging the soil. Because if you weed and you dig over the soil all the time, you're disturbing um, the baby beetles that are living in the soil and waiting to become adults. Um, and so not digging so much is a really good thing and not weeding because I used to think weeds weeds were bad but dandelions and buttercups and forget-me-nots all these amazing uh, flowers they're really important to um, the health of our insects and they're gorgeous to look at so I have stopped pulling them up now and um, I enjoy having them in my in my little wild garden. They're great tips and they're accessible to all of us um, if we have a garden. So what about people who they, maybe they don't have gardens? They might live in, in flats or in very, very urban areas. You know, what, what can people who, who yeah, live in, in, in those more built up areas, what can they do? Well, even in an urban environment that looks quite full of concrete, there's always little bits, little patches of green where amazing things are happening. So just a tiny scrub bit with a few bushes, you will find if you nurture native plants in there and you encourage dandelions and all the other plants, you will find lots of insects flying into that area. So I think the, the thing I say is look carefully, because even in a place that looks quite inhospitable, you'll normally find amazing things living. How many people have noticed when they look on a piece of concrete, there's usually those amazing tiny little red mites scurrying across the surface. So in, insects are amazing because they'll make their home pretty much anywhere. So, yeah, I don't think people who haven't got a garden should feel they cannot observe um, insects. I think that's a really good point. Really, really good point. A fab. Right. I'm, and they're, they're so easy because, you know, some people might might not want to let their whole garden go well, but it's easy to create a patch or a border, isn't it? Totally, yes. If you if you don't want to cut, let your entire lawn go, well, why not just let a big patch around the edge go? Um, so you've still got a place to sit and then you've got the best of both worlds because um, I think humans and people can cohabit really well in outside spaces. You just need to start thinking of your garden as a place you're sharing with the insects rather than you being completely in charge of it. And then, and also very few insects completely kill a plant by eating it. So maybe when you see a hole in a plant, instead of thinking that you need to get rid of what made it, you think you're feeding an insect, which is amazing. So there's a few things that obviously cause a real pest for gardeners, but most things, most things are wonderful to have in the garden and should be encouraged, I think, anyway. Yeah, I really like that point about, you know, sharing our space, sharing our world with these little critters. Yes, exactly. Mm. I think it's really, nice really important. Yeah, it's a really nice reframe. Brilliant. There we go. Well, I think there's a big difference between the one that took me a, quite a few hours and the one that I've just done quickly. But I think it gives you enough idea that, that it is quite a quick process. And um, we have got a, a Padlet link, um, which we're trialing out. And you can upload your collages to that Padlet link. So it would be great if some people try that out and see if it works for me. And I'd love to see the work you've been doing in the session. Um, Yes. Yeah. So we'll pop um, a link to that. Um, it'll be up on our on the on the screen soon, and we'll also pop it in the comments for you to click through, because yeah. Marion also has a number of resources on there. So if you're starting out thinking this looks too complicated, she's got some lovely framework and templates in there that you can take and do for yourself with your family. There's also a QR code that you'll see pop up now on the screen, and you can take your phone and scan that, and that will take you straight into this. Padlet, and it's essentially a digital space of resources that you can download, but you can also upload and be part of this community of Buzz and Scuttle. And you can also add in your details. So, for instance, if you're in Tring or if you're in a, um, a lo you run a local community centre or a children's group, uh, or you're in a city farm, and you think, oh, we'd love to have Marion come along, either in real life or virtually, then this is a really, really good way that you can add your details, and she can get in touch. Yes, that would be great. What I'd absolutely love is hundreds of different schools all around the country starting to um, collage insects and we could have some sort of great big online exhibition with all the work. It would be wonderful, wouldn't it? That, that would give me goosebumps. That would be yeah. amazing, wouldn't it? It would, yeah. And I think there's there's not enough time for art uh, at the moment as well in schools a lot of the time. And um, so we need to do as much art as possible and as much insect watching as possible. And the two things make a really good combination. They really do. So yeah. why don't we spend a little bit of time, because you've kind of obviously shown there um, the, the basic that you've got there. Why don't we go through some of the ways we can do the little tweaks? So you've, you've already said there, you know, with the eyes and getting that kind of glassy sheen, you can look yeah. at things like 
you know, food or maybe furniture surfaces on, um, you know, furniture magazines. I'm just um, gonna, I'll take one earphone right now because I'm just going to reach back and show you some of my originals. Hang on a minute. Right. And then you've also said with Sarah, who was doing the bumblebee, you've talked about finding materials that are slightly um, sticky, such as um, you know, toy magazines and teddies. They can have that kind of nice texture too. So yeah, it'd be great to have a look at some of the other bits that you've done and just go through and give tips for how we create certain um, certain features. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna show you some wings. Okay, so when you're collaging wings. You have to try and make them look see-through. So this is a really amazing football hoverfly that I collage. Now, the wings are just cut out paper, and the paper isn't actually see-through at all. But if you collage um, the legs to be slightly lighter than where they're not covered in the wings, so here's the, the, the real bit of leg with no wing covering, and then where it goes underneath the wing, you find a piece of paper that's just slightly lighter and stick it on and it gives the illusion that the wing is see-through. So they are just cut out bits of paper. There's no trace or tracing paper or tissue paper or anything. It's just, but it looks like it's see-through. So that's my tip for how to do a, a fly wing. And that's then- absolutely incredible. <laughs> what a great tip. Um, hang on a minute. Then I'm gonna, hang on, take my headphone off again. Um, what a great tip. I'm just trying to find a, um, a bee that's fluffy, sorry. I should have um, done this before. No, yeah, it's all good. Okay. Oh, here's a bumblebee, okay. Oh, yes, Sarah, sorry. I hope you're watching. Okay, so there we go. This is the bumblebee. Now, if you can see, I've just done lots of little cuts around the bottom, but what I've done is found a piece of paper that's fluffy. So it's a, I think that was a photograph of an orangutan or something fluffy from a nature magazine. So, um, and the other thing that's good is this bit here, this is a picture of a field of corn. So sometimes grass or, or corn can also look like fluff if it's, a, if it's photographed in a certain way. So I think this was a corn field and I think that was something fluffy um, in, a, in an animal mag. And I cut out and then did lots of little zigzags around the bottom to make it look fluffy before I cut, um, stuck it down. And again, for the wings, can you see the same thing as before, that where, where the leg goes under the wing, you use a not quite black. And if you stick that on top of your wing, it looks like the wings see through when it's not. So the way that you do, you get good at collage is just by really carefully looking in the colors at what you're collaging. So if you study the insect and really look at the colors that make it up and the textures, then you can choose the right bits to make the collage from. And like I said, the eyes, the shinier you can find a grape or an olive to cut out for the eye or a bead in a magazine, they make beautiful, shiny eyes. Or you can cut out a little black piece and then scratch a little white dot onto the surface. Um, and that will become like a little bead of light on the eye as well. Uh, let's see what else I've got here. So, oh, these, these beetles have just come out in the last week. So um, hang on a minute. I'll just go down so you can see it. This is a... Um, a green malachite beetle. They've be just come out in the last few days and they're quite small. So um, oh, roughly, I think about four millimetres. Don't quote me on that, but they're quite small little beetles and they've definitely been out in the fields around where we live in the last week. And they've got this beautiful red ends to their um, wing cases. And then this is a favourite of mine. So this is a cinnamon bug and they look really exotic. Um, and we've got those flying around our garden here as well. Um, and they settle on the, on the leaves. And if they settle on a green leaf, the red and the black look so amazing. They're really um, eye-catching little beetles. And sometimes people just don't notice them. Oh, sorry, it's, it's a bug, isn't it? I've got to make the difference between my bugs and beetles. I do apologize. Hang on a minute. I'll see what else I can find in my box. So I've got here this one. This is a lily beetle. Now, lily beetles, uh, they've come to our country not that long ago, probably on an imported plant, I think. And they do love eating lilies, so which makes them quite unpopular with some gardeners. But I think they're so beautiful. Look at their red, red, red wing case. And the amazing thing about them is when they're scared, they make a little squeaking sound. So you have to try not to alarm them because they will squeak. And quite a lot of insects have got good defense mechanisms, like green shield bugs let off a really funny stink when you scare them. So insects have different ways of telling you that they don't really want to be handled. But very rarely um, 
anything will nip you. They just make a smell to get rid of you, basically. Tell yeah. you to go away. <laughs> to deter us, for sure. Yeah. So, um, there you go. Are the comments coming in of how people are doing? Has anybody so we have had, but yeah, so Sarah has found, she has found some pictures of brown bears for the fuzz of her bumblebee, of her buff-tailed bumblebee Fantastic. queen. Fantastic, that's really good. And the um, magazines with big patches of colour tend to be the best, so just fashion magazines with great big pictures of uh, expanses of colour or interior design magazines or the one, the magazines you get with the nice big patches are the best to chop up. And um, the way I organise myself, I don't know if you can see behind me, but I've got lots of drawers and in each drawer they're all indexed so I've got a red drawer and a blue drawer and a wood coloured drawer and that way I've learned to um, index my bits so I can find them quickly otherwise you just end up in a room covered with bits of paper so some sort of organisation system when you get into collage is quite important. I think I'm realising this now because yes I'm, I've just got a lot of mess coming across yeah. here. <laughs> Mess is good. I like mess. <laughs> well, I must say, National Geographic has been great. Country life yeah. has been great. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. And let's see what else I can find in the box. I was just thinking actually there about that. You know, you're talking, I love the idea of that, you know, the see-through wing with the with the legs underneath. And I was thinking actually um shadows on on in magazines would be really, really good for that lighter, that lighter kind of black, wouldn't it? Yes, exactly. And and things like neck curtains are very good for, for wings as well. So you need a, a sort of speckledy grey. Uh, I've got a, one, a lovely a couple with good patterns here. If you're thinking of patterns you'd like to put on your beetle. This is a, an asparagus beetle. Um, and he does like munching asparagus. Again, makes him slightly unpopular with some gardeners. But what an amazing beetle with a combination of the orange and black and these little, little um punctuation marks down the bottom here and then I've also got a rosemary beetle likewise does a bit of nibbling on rosemary plants but will never kill the plant so um, I love having them in the garden they're oh, just so beautiful and I don't think I've quite shown my beetle off to its best advantage I'm thinking of recollaging this one because when you find a real one they're like a little jewel they are so extraordinarily beautiful and they live just around the, the leaves on uh, lavenders and, and rosemary bushes. So go out and have a look because they might be in your garden. And you've just never even noticed. Um, yeah, so that's one of my favourites that we find in our garden. Yeah, that's so... Oh. Stunning. Absolutely stunning. So for that one there, how are you creating the sheen on, on, on this one? This oh this was really tricky to do. I said the shiny ones are the hardest. So to try and find something in a magazine with a curve on it is quite difficult sometimes. So sometimes I can spend half an hour just searching for one particular colour um, and I get really grumpy because I can't quite find the bit I want. Um, and even now I do a collage and then either I'll see the real beetle or I'll put it down for a bit and realise I didn't do it quite well enough or I made a mistake. So I'll revisit and re-collage things when I've realised I've got things wrong. So sometimes the copper markings on this, but they're almost pink, purpley pink. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think I might redo that in the next few days. Yeah, there we go. So, um, uh, yeah, I'm trying to think what else I can show you. No, this is great. So i just go through a few more tips, I think, here. So how about, because um, the antennae are quite prominent, the head and the antennae is quite prominent feature, isn't it? So what, how, what are your tips for creating kind of those small structures, so the ends of our, of our legs and our antennae? Well, I do use a scalpel, but I would say at home you have to be really careful with that because they're terribly sharp. But I think it's just very careful cutting. So if you want to do really small little antennae, it's just maybe using nail scissors and then just trying to keep your hands clean so you need to just um carefully put the pieces down and not use too much glue because you'll end up sticking yourself to the collage rather than keeping it nice and clean but little beads um or little shiny um balls in magazines make lovely lovely antennae so it's about looking for the right shape a lot of the time as well as the color when you're sticking something down you see the light bit here i think i scratched that away a little bit so there's some extra white sheen that I just took away with a, a scalpel to make it look extra shiny because you really want to show the curve on the back of the ladybird. 
These are such great tips. And it, what for me, what I'm what I'm hearing, what I'm realizing, I maybe next time I will do before is there's a I think there's quite a lot of prep work in order to like be able to sit down and then actually enjoy the creative process, you know, going through and actually like you say, really observing those forms and shapes and colors, um, you know, taking a real look at that, noting those things down. I probably would even just write down the little types of things I want to find and then taking that stack of magazines and, and having a good cutout before I sit down and start. Yeah, you're so right. So I do that. I spread them all out of the desk first before I stick anything down and make sure all the colours are right. So before I start on the actual collage, it's all laid out. But you have to be really careful that you don't sneeze on your work or open a window because all the bits will fly away. So, <laughs> But I end up with a table full of bits and then I stick it down when I'm totally sure that I've got all the bits right and they all work together. But yeah, you're exactly right. I think your plan is very good. Brilliant. Um. We just, you know, we discussed earlier, um, you know, how good children are at noticing stuff and nudging, you know, nudging their families to make a difference kind of at that local level. I'd love you to share that story um, that you shared with me about the poster that was up in your up in your window. Oh, and, yes. Yes. And, and actually how that um, made made a change for just just a, a, a neighbour. And I thought it was such a lovely story. Yes, I put a pollinator poster up with lots of um, pollinator insects for September. And there's so many different sorts of insects that fly into your garden and, and pollinate the flowers. And very few of them sting you or hurt you. Uh, I put a big poster up in the window and one of the neighbours who lives far up the road stopped me outside the house and said that since the poster went up, she'd stopped squashing things um, and was looking at them in carefully instead. And she'd noted several different species on the poster that were in her garden and she had been scared of them and now realised that they were just pollinating her flowers and were no, no threat to her whatsoever. So yeah, it made me really thrilled um, to know that somebody's changed the way that they view insects just through seeing one of my posters. And that's the aim really, is to make people love insects as much as I do and um, and realise how, how lucky we are to have them and how with some small changes you can encourage them into your garden rather than shooing them away. Absolutely, and I just thought that was wonderful. And you know, that's the power of art to actually support our planet. You know, yeah. it's it's interlinked and uh, it's available to every single one of us who's watching this now. It really is. So um, we've got some some lovely comments coming in saying, you know, absolutely amazing work. Um, how does Marion do the wing segments and all the joints? So we did cover some of the wing segments. <gasps> so, Marian, do you want to, so you can watch back and hear about the wing segments. But do you want to just talk over the joints before we kind yeah, of... Yeah, you just count them. them. If you look at the real thing, just count the number of joints and bobbles and you just copy what you see it's as simple as that so usually there's quite a lot of little sections so you just have to make sure if you're trying to do it accurately that you've got the right number of sections um, so I think it's all about observing carefully and it's very hard when they're moving as well so sometimes going online and finding a photograph of the thing you've just seen is really helpful because sometimes they're very small the things that you find that are alive and you don't want to hurt them so it does take a bit of research and a bit of advice and help and I'm very lucky that I've got an entomologist, uh, entomologist friend who corrects me when I make mistakes on mine because quite often I'll get things wrong so don't worry just have a go and then if you're trying to do accurately there's lots of people that will help you yeah absolutely look so we are we are fast running out of time I think we could all sit I think this does we should, I would love to come and sit and do a half day of doing this uh, I just think it would be wonderful. So this is almost like a taster, isn't it, Marion? It's just a mini taster. Um, and I've, you know, I've, I've got so far, Yay. but I'm, I'm going to carry on with this with this later. Um, so it doesn't matter if you haven't finished. Um, it's about having a start and getting curious. And just in this 45 minutes, I've noticed something in the peacock, bu peacock butterflies I hadn't noticed before. You know, so just, just taking that time out has been absolutely fantastic. So Marion, where can people find out a little bit more about you? Um, I'll just note as well quickly before I do that is that the poster that Marion was talking about with the pollinators and other things are available in that Padlet as well. So you can pop up a poster in in your in your window or better still pop up, pop up some of your own creations um, with a message about why this is important. I think if we all did that, imagine all our windows with something in making people stop and think and change their behaviours in a positive light. So yeah. Marion, where can people find out a little bit more? About okay, this? so you can look at my website, which is um, marionhill.co.uk. And also my work is featured on the Bathscape website um, in their education section. So you can download all my spotting guides. Um, and there have been posters going up in bath parks, but if you're not a bath resident, then they're, yeah, they're free to 
download on those sites. Um, and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram to see where I'll be doing workshops over the summer. Obviously, with COVID allowing, there'll be <laughs> things online or physical, depending on what happens. But yeah. it's been amazing. This is my trial run of Collage Online. So it's maybe been slightly glitchy and I'll get better as I go. Because, uh, yes, it's really strange trying to do everything on camera and answer questions at the same time. So I hope you'll forgive me if I got the odd fact wrong or stuck something upside down. <laughs> No, it's been fantastic. It's, it's actually lovely to see the simplified version, you know, and obviously how we can work that up into the more complex version. And uh, I have a feeling there's going to be lots of amazing collaborations uh, and communities wanting to get involved, Marion. And in fact, a friend of mine, I tagged you in um, some of her, I tagged her in some of your work, uh, Dr. Jess French, who is a mini beast presenter on BBC Kids Programme and has, oh, is, has a number of incredibly awesome children's books on mini beasts and protecting the planet. And she said a collaboration sounds like a wonderful thing to do so you know i think i think it's it's your your enthusiasm is infectious which i'm sure everyone who's watching live or watching back will agree and it's such a simple and precious activity to be able to do as a family as well so a well, huge thank you for having me it's been really fun thanks ebony Huge thank you. And look, everyone, make sure to check out the rest of Festival of Nature 2021. We've got podcasts, live streams, pre-recorded videos, tips and tricks. You can follow the hashtag uh, at Fest of Nature 21 and do share what nature means to you by hashtag in my nature. And we're really looking forward to seeing all your wonderful creations um, as well, inspired by Marion Hill's fantastic work. So thank you so much.